Shadow International Development Minister Lisa Nandy joins me now. Uh, I think you're on a chilly bridge in the Salford Keys, Lisa. It's always chilly up north, but we manage. <laughs> I'm not. I am not going on about Manchester. Uh, Manchester. I know what ha <laughs> what happens on social media when I do that. Um, look, before we get yeah. on to politi party politics, um, we are carrying a story this morning about the early release scheme launched last October, take, to take pressure off uh, overcrowded prisons. Now, it looks like this might be extended indefinitely. In principle, would you support that extension? Well, actually, we're really concerned about the story that you've broken this morning. Um, we uh, aren't opposed to prisoners being released early, but if there are good grounds to do so, and it keeps the public more safe and present, prevents re-offending rather than less. But there's a big difference between an early release scheme that is designed to keep the public safe and an early release scheme that is a consequence of chaos, not just in the prison system, but in the court system as well. When you've got a huge backlog in the court system, when you've got overcrowded prisons and ministers with seemingly no clue about how to deal with it, you cannot end up in a situation where you're just releasing people onto the streets of Britain as a consequence with potential implications for public safety. We want the government to come to the House of Commons urgently to explain what this scheme is, uh, and it is deeply concerning that they haven't sought to do that, and it's come down to Sky News to alert the public and Parliament to what is happening. Uh, so you hope they'll say something about that in the next couple of days? We think there needs to be a proper explanation over the next few days in Parliament. The government ought to bring a statement to the House of Commons in order to answer MPs' questions and reassure the public that this is not uh, just a knee-jerk reaction to a chaotic, overcrowded prison system that they've presided over, but is genuinely a measure that could, where they can guarantee the safety and security of the public. Uh, it doesn't... On previous occasions, ministers haven't okay. been able to do that, and we'll be pushing very hard to make sure that they do. OK, two, two words you've just used have triggered me, chaos and parliament. Um, your leader says that he didn't lean on the speaker to rip up parliamentary conventions this week. Um, if it wasn't Sir Keir who did that, uh, did anyone else from Labour threaten to withdraw the party's support from Sir Lindsay? No, I'm absolutely certain of that. I mean, you never, you never say you're certain of things in politics in case they come back to bite you. But actually, I, I don't believe for a moment that anyone in Labour did. And certainly our chief whip, Keir Starmer, none of the senior figures in Labour would ever dream of threatening the Speaker. I mean, this I've been an MP for 14 years. That is not what you do. Uh, the idea that speakers can be pushed around by members of parliament, uh, leaders of political parties, is frankly for the birds. There were okay. MPs from all political parties who made representations to the speaker, not just about their safety and security, but also about the fact that we've got an impending ground invasion in Rafa. There was an urgent need for the House of Commons to speak with one voice to prevent that from happening and to back an immediate humanitarian ceasefire. And there were real concerns, particularly amongst many of our MPs... But about the Tory motion not going far enough and the SNP motion lacking balance. I think he may, made the right back... decision. And if the Tories hadn't withdrawn their vote, Parliament would have had the chance to may, 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 take may, may, a view may I, may I come of back all of the... the propositions before us. May I come back to the Go first on. and very important point you, you made? Um, the Speaker said that he took action because uh, he was told of threats and intimidation to MPs. Everybody is aware of the dreadful incidents that led to the deaths of David Amos and Joe Cox and further back, Ian Gow, not to mention the attack on Stephen Timms, which he survived. They all had different motivations. Do you have any idea what Sir Lindsay was referring to on this specific occasion? Who was making the threat? Well, I, I, my understanding is having... Because I had a lot of this incoming from members of Parliament as well, uh, particularly since the 7th of October, what we've seen happening on the streets of Britain, the rise in Islamophobia and anti-Semitism is also reflected in anger towards MPs. 
Um, I think there will be many, many MPs who will have been in contact with the Speaker over the course of the last few months and particularly in the last couple of weeks as tensions were heightened, expressing concerns about their safety. And many of those concerns that were expressed to me weren't just about safety. They were about the fact that members of Parliament wanted the chance to be able to yeah, reflect so before, their views accurately Forgive me, accurately before we get off record. the issue of safety, sure. who, because it, uh, it's been said by Speaker and others that this was largely apparently directed at Labour MPs, who is making threats to Labour MPs? We knew well, what look, it was in I, the case of Gal. We knew what it was in the case of uh, Joe Cox. We knew what it was the case, what it was in the case of David Amos. Who is making threats now? Well, look, I'd, I'd say to you, Trevor, that that's part of the problem, is that our political debate has really become one that is very angry. Social media grants a great deal of anonymity. My predecessor stood down in 2010, and the number of emails that he used to receive was fairly minimal compared to the thousands that pour into my inbox every week. And, of course, emails are, are pretty anonymous, they're pretty immediate as well. We've had incidents over the last few months where people, including me, have been accosted on the street and surrounded and filmed. Um, the, the, over the 14 years that I've been in Parliament, I've watched this but, get worse and worse. We saw it in forgive Brexit. Me for interrupting uh, you, I but, was... and uh, I'm just going to make one last attempt here, and if you don't want to answer, by all means say you don't want to answer. You, you're having all of these hundreds of emails, people are talking to you directly. Who is making the threat? Well, I'm sorry, I am trying to answer your question, but the, the point that I'm trying to make is that this is coming on multiple issues in multiple directions. I first started to really feel it during the Brexit debates and I was my family was threatened by people who supported both Leave and Remain. Uh, we've had it in the Labour Party and in the Conservative Party during quite difficult periods, during uh, controversial leaderships. We've had it in the last few months over the issues around Israel and Palestine and I've been threatened by people who purport to stand for Israel and purport to stand for Palestine okay. as well. The point that I'm making is this is a wider problem of the way in which our political discourse has become angry and divisive. And that's the importance of what we're dealing with this week uh, with the Conservatives, okay. is that all politicians, senior politicians, need to stand up to this, not okay. stoke it. Can I, can I just ask you a very practical question? If MPs were under sure. duress on Wednesday, should they have had that debate at all? Yes, I think the Houses of Parliament can't be prevented from having debates because of pressure from anybody. That's a central part of democracy. And, you know, there's been a lot of talk about MPs' security, and it's right that we okay. focus on that because it matters that people aren't pressured. But there's also a bigger point here, which is that people standing outside shouting and protesting and threatening us, I will never change my vote because, and my decision-making because of what they do. The people that I listen to are the people who come to debate, to discuss, to make their points as robustly as they feel that they need to, not the people who are threatening. I think it's really important that MPs stand up for that and, make, and, and reassure the public that we do put public interest at the centre of our considerations. All right, can I ask you, uh, I mean, you guys are there to debate policy. Can I uh, deal with one issue of policy before we come back to the issue of politics? Um, Labour Party saying this morning that you want to build a three, 300,000 homes each year. Um, last time we achieved that was 1977. Um, what specific planning reforms that uh, do you have in mind that will uh, allow you to achieve what, what now more than 40 years of governments of all colours have failed to do? Well, we, we want to do two things when it comes to planning. The first is that we want to streamline the planning process so that there aren't opportunities to make multiple objections once permission has been granted. And we want to bring the public earlier into that conversation, requiring all places to have a local and regional plan uh, that gets the houses built, not just the houses, but the infrastructure that we need in this country uh, to deal with the problems in the national grid and elsewhere. 
elsewhere to make sure that we really get on the front foot and solve this. My okay. experience of planning as an MP for 14 years is that people are only brought into the conversation when most of the decisions have been made and that's what causes such fractious debate and such delays. We want All to right. make sure that we send a very clear message that the public get a decision early, we make that decision, we stick to it and we get Britain building again. OK, that's, that's clear. So there will be fewer opportunities to object to planning cha uh, to changes and buildings under Labour. That's clear. Let's go back to talk to the big event coming this week, the Rochdale by-election. In that by-election, who should Labour supporters vote for? Well, we, we don't have a candidate, I'm afraid, so I can't answer that question. I was asked earlier this week oh. what I would do. Um, would, my colleague Wes Streeting said he would probably spoil spoil his ballot paper. My answer is I would just ask people not to vote for candidates who are spouting hate and division. We've had enough of that. We've seen it from the Conservative Party this weekend. We need politicians and leaders who can stand up for public decency and integrity and speak for all people in this country, bring people can, together can you, at a time when can, many can people are Can you identify are any of the candidates frightened. on the list who is not spouting hate for us? You can I'm identify two or three no, if you want. The, no, I mean, I'm afraid, I'm afraid I can't endorse a candidate in this race. That is the no, consequence I'm not asking you to endorse of us candidate. having taken the unprecedented step to withdraw our You said, you said you were telling the public not to vote for people who are spouting hate. And I think it would help, be helpful to the public to know which candidates, in your opinion, answer to that description. Well, you're asking me as a, a Labour representative to start endorsing candidates from other political parties. I'm afraid I can't do that. I think the best option would have been to have a good Labour candidate. We're not in that situation. We were right to take that step. I would just ask people not to endorse those candidates who, you know, when I was there on the Sunday, I was watching people, our activists and others, being intimidated and harassed, uh, people speaking about dividing communities at a time when we should be bringing people together. I just ask people to use their judgment and to make sure that whoever is elected in the Rochdale by-election this week, that we elect somebody who's going to stand firm against that. Just very quickly, do you regret uh, going out leafleting last Sunday for Mr... Uh, two Sundays ago, I beg your pardon, for Mr Azhar Ali after you knew he had said the things that we now know he said? Well, I didn't know that he'd made anti-Semitic comments. I was appalled by what he said about Israel, as was the Labour Party. And we had a pre-scheduled community event that I'd been asked to continue to do. Okay. I wouldn't campaign for a candidate who was anti-Semitic. As soon as those comments came to light, he was withdrawn as the candidate, and rightly so. And I regret the fact that we're going to the polls on Thursday without a Labour candidate, especially in a race as important as this. Okay. But it was the right thing to do. We will always stand up against racism where we see it. Okay, last question, last question, if I may, on Mr. Lee Anderson. Um, has the Conservative Party done the right thing uh, in a timely fashion to essentially sack Mr. Anderson? I think what's going on in the Conservative Party is dangerous and it's bigger than Lee Anderson. Um, you've got somebody who was the deputy chairman under Sunak, somebody who was the Home Secretary under Sunak, somebody who the Conservative Party made Prime Minister 18 months ago, who have repeatedly um, sought to stoke hate and division, spouting conspiracy theories that are normally confined to the sort of thing that we see online, and a Prime Minister who's standing on the sidelines watching pol our political discourse being dragged into the gutter. It's dangerous, it seems to be very widespread, as Saeed Avasi said quite compellingly okay. yesterday, that there is a rot at the heart of the Conservative Party. We need leaders okay. who are going to stand up to this sort of bile okay. and not stoke it. Thank, thanks very much indeed, Lisa and Andy, for your time this morning. Thank you. Well, of course, I've been speaking to Lisa and Andy about the Rockdale by-election, so here is the full list of candidates and the political parties they represent. This is after the Labour Party withdrew its support for Azza Ali, but he will still appear on voting papers as the party's candidate because the deadline to change it had passed. Um, now, the by-election is going to be held this coming Thursday on the 29th and February. 